Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining. Um, we have a fantastic slate of experts that I myself in my work have been, are, are in constant co contact with throughout my reporting. Um, and I am excited to introduce you all to them. Uh, we have Anna Santos Rutschman, a health law and policy scholar on Biden's COVID-19 Innovation Committee. Um, we've got Joan Donovan, the Research Director of Harvard Shorenstein Center. And we've got Renee DeResta, Technical Research Manager at the Stanford Internet Observatory. Um, thanks so much for being here all. I wanted to start off with a little bit of table setting. Um, in the last year, we saw, as Representative Eshu said, just an infodemic that has affected really all of the information that we're getting about the coronavirus. But I don't believe that has started just last year with the onset of coronavirus. Is that Right, and can you give us a little bit of background on the networks that were already in place when coronavirus became an emerging um, news item? Uh, Joan, why don't we start with you? Hey everyone, really excited to be in conversation and, and Davey, just very, very thankful for you getting the word out every day on the disinformation beat. I know it's a, it's a total grind and um, it's really, it, sometimes you really feel like you're, uh, you know, shouting at the wall when you're saying, how could lies get this big? Um, but when we think about medical misinformation in particular as uh, an object of research, you know, we've got uh, a century of anti-vaxxer history to look through, you know, going back to uh, the early uh, 1900s where people wanted to uh, have laws about getting people vaccinated because vaccines are different kind of medicine entirely in the sense that uh, I get a vaccine, of course, to protect myself, but it only really works uh, as a, as a tool to protect society if everybody gets it, because there are going to be people who cannot get vaccines because of other uh, medical conditions and, and whatnot. But when we talk about older forms of, uh, you know, medical misinformation, we might call it snake oil or quackery. Uh, so we've always had people in, uh, that are in, imposters in some sense, pretending to be doctors or pretending to have some kind of knowledge about the body that they don't. Uh, this, you know, supplement industry that has grown up alongside our pharmacology as a way to deal with uh, different kinds of medical ailments. Um, and, you know, so we have we've had we've been through some of this in the past. Right. And so the public agencies, public health agencies in particular, public health schools do a really good job of figuring out, you know, what communities are resistant to vaccine information or hesitant towards vaccine information, uh, skeptical of the medical establishment. Some of this is a result of uh, being harmed by, you know, different experiments that have been run, uh, particularly the Tuskegee exper experiment. But when we talk about like medical misinformation online, we're talking about something entirely uh, similar in content, but really different in the mechanics of it. That is the scale by which it spreads, the tactics used by uh, anti-vaccination, anti-vaxxer uh, groups and spokespeople, the uh, news industry that's kind of built up around it to give it this veneer of scientism. And then, uh, and this will be my last point, is when you have all of that going on, which uh, in the midst of a pandemic becomes a very fertile ground for sowing distrust in medicine and science, then when you layer in the political dimensions uh, and the ways in which this pandemic has affected our economy and our politic, the pandemic itself becomes a kind of uh, political cudgel and medical misinformation then becomes a tool or, you know, some would say 
even a weapon in uh, information operations. And so happy to get into that as we develop the conversation. But from my perspective, the, the way in which social media enables medical misinformation at scale is really something that we have to address head on. Thanks for that, Joan. And Renee, I wanted to turn it over to you. And, you know, we've established that this has been a problem even before kind of the coronavirus pandemic emerged. Um, what can you say about the online communities and the networked um, sort of um, communities that exist online and there's the state of things um, as we saw this coronavirus becoming a bigger problem? Yeah, well, thanks for uh, thanks for moderating. It's great to be here with everyone. Um, so the metaphor of virality, when we talk about viral content on the internet, um, that metaphor comes from epidemiology. So I think it's really interesting to look at that, um, that phenomenon in this case. So you have vulnerable communities infected by a disease that spread to other communities via person-to-person -person transmission, often quickly and depending on the disease, potentially exponentially, right? And so what you see online is that same dynamic is happening. So you have a piece of content or some claim in this case about coronavirus and these communities um, have been established for a very long time. The anti-vaccine movement established a foothold on social media. Uh, the earliest, largest organizations as far back as 2009, uh, the most politically active, the most well-networked in 2015, actually in response to fighting California's uh, vaccine bill, SB 277, which was the law that removed uh, the voluntary opt-out from the childhood immunization schedule in public schools. And in the course of doing that, the anti-vaccine movement, um, which while very well uh, coordinated online is not as large, and particularly in 2015 was not as large as people may think. And what it had to do is it had to connect with other communities and it had to network with other communities. Uh, and so at the time in 2015, it leaned into the Tea Party. And the idea of vaccination as government tyranny or vaccination as vast government overreach was really laid down. Those claims are really laid down. Um, as, as Joan mentioned, we have these narratives that date back to the era of smallpox variolation. But what you see in 2015 is you see that real incorporation of not only the toxins and autism and health concerns narratives uh, as, as the kind of stereotypical anti-vaccine canards, you start to see the uh, the Tea Party narratives that say that this is government tyranny and overreach. And that really resonated at the time with people who were members of those communities. So all of a sudden you had anti-vaccine hashtags and anti-vaccine content being pushed into second amendment hashtags and content and top conservative on Twitter. And they even went so far as to try to get them into Black Lives Matter um, communities by way of these hashtags. Again, that idea of virality and spreading it from one community to another community uh, in this case, by way of memes and hashtags. Anna, as a member of this um, administration, uh, what challenges are ahead of you and what challenges have been sort of teed up, I guess, um, given the last four years? Um, well, thank you for having me. It's a privilege to be part of this um, panel with these amazing researchers and women. Um, just a quick framing um, note. Um, I was an advisor to the campaign. I'm not an advisor um, to the administration, to the current administration, which in many ways, the work you have to do not knowing what might be happening as vaccines um, are set to receive you know, authorization from the FDA and we don't quite know what the plans to roll them out might be, what the discourse about the now availability of vaccines might be that um, made the campaign have to contemplate a lot of scenarios. Some have not come to pass and some were facing them. Um, right now. So I can speak a little bit um, to that. And then I can, you know, as, as a scholar and as a policy um, and law person, I can talk about some of the, of the present challenges we're now seeing um, surface um, here. Um, part of it um, goes to some of the issues that we've already touched on, the idea that there's a preceding um, epidemic. So there's the virus at the root of COVID-19, but vaccine misinformation and disinformation precedes that um, epidemic. And just before um, COVID, we were seeing attrition in the rates of uh, vaccination um, in the US and, um, and elsewhere. Um, but we were also seeing, I think, as that epidemic grew and grew uh, even before COVID, 
COVID, we were seeing something that I think is positive. And I know that members of the campaign and the administration are aware of, which is the fact that we now have very granular data on what vaccine misinformation looks like. Part of it because of the work of people like um, Joan, who explained it um, to us. Part of it because of what Renee just uh, mentioned, um, that we understand how the anti-vax or vaccine questioning networks um, operate. We know that COVID has maximized the reach uh, of those um, networks. We know exactly how many accounts um, that have been labeled as um, anti-vax, for instance, have been added by each one of the mainstream networks. We even suspect or have some pretty reliable math on, for instance, monetization of um, anti-vaccine content associated with accounts that tend to thrive on different types of health misinformation complicating things, having us look at different uh, pathways towards um, the dissemination of anti-vaccine um, content. So we have all these um, data to build on. Um, and, and I think um, that's a tool that we were not as aware of uh, before. Up until 2018, and this is information that um, the administration um, certainly works on, up until 2018, uh, we had very little information on, for instance, Russia-centered um, efforts to promote vaccine misinformation. And it turns out they send accurate and inaccurate information our way at the same time, just to increase divisiveness. It doesn't really matter to the senders that it's vaccine specific. It's just a tool. It's been instrumentalized. So the problem is bigger. The tools that we have, and particularly the data that we now have, and this is an administration that relies on science and on data, um, are, are much better. So you've seen specific proposals. Um, House Democrats have proposed a multi-agency um, commission, for instance, or task force um, that would look broadly at misinformation um, issues and certainly COVID-19 related misinformation um, issues would be um, at the center of that. This strikes me as a really good um, good idea. And I have two points to make. One is related um, to this. Um, and it's this idea that we may be talking about vaccine misinformation, um, but it's not an environment that's restricted to vaccines. Things that have happened um, elsewhere um, in the COVID pandemic, for instance, involving the FDA and some of the discourses that were made about emergency um, use authorizations of products that had nothing to do with vaccines, but there was some overstudying of data. So some things that damaged some institutional reputation that um, the current administration is now seeking um, to repair. I think this points to extensive damage. Um, and I think the idea of understanding vaccine misinformation as being about health misinformation and about even more than that um, is crucial. And then on the other hand, um, again, not taking you know half my um, advisory hat, but the legal scholar one in me, I would just you know, conclude this first intervention by saying, from a legal perspective, from a policy perspective, there's a number of things we can do. Um, and they can range from um, nudging certain behaviors, um, being more uh, better at communicating at different levels, from federal level to local level. And then there are what I would call nuclear, nuclear options. Say we want to regulate this very stringently and, and, and strictly. And they might be on the table. The administration is aware of some of those options, but just because we can be extremely stringent, it doesn't necessarily mean we should. Um, sometimes reaching for some uh, form of compromise and be, being more dialectic, I think it is a better option than, again, imposing certain um, acts that will be reconstrued um, as paternalistic or government influ influenced and ultimately might backfire in addressing the infodemic. Thanks so much for that, Anna. Um, I'm curious, you know, this this situation, this global pandemic that has made us all sort of, you know, be anchored to our houses, our apartments, our homes for the last year. Um, it's really unprecedented. We haven't seen a pandemic on this scale um, in, you know, a century. So I, I guess I'm curious, you know, thinking about how it complicated this this even is from an education perspective and the the flow of information about how this all came to pass what the state of things are all of this um i'm curious to get a little more context on that and i want to latch on anna to a little bit of um what you said about um sort of the way other countries have also um you know, uh, figured out how to communicate or maybe seen this as an opportunity 
to muddy the waters perhaps. Renee, I know that you've done a lot of research on um, sort of Russia disinformation, um, even in, in, in sort of the 2016 elections and are familiar with these networks. Can you give us a little bit of context on, on this like global um, disinformation problem and how the pandemic hooks into that? Yeah, I love this question. The, um, so we started looking in January, we started noticing uh, of last year, so a full year ago, uh, anti-vaccine activists in the US talking about this disease in China and, uh, and already kind of laying the dark, um, the dark groundwork for this idea that it was going to become a way for the, uh, the elites to mass vaccinate the planet. So this is a very common, very common conspiracy. We see it every time there's an Ebola outbreak, Zika, you name it, it pops up. Bill Gates right in there from day one. Um, but what was really fascinating about COVID as it unfolded was that it did become a pandemic and it became a global pandemic. And that's very unique because in past epidemics like Ebola or Zika, they're largely geographically confined. And that means that the people who are paying attention to them, even in the online environment, which is borderless, uh, are still largely to some extent geographically, you know, they're, they're the people who are in the, the geographic uh, area of, uh, of, of infections. Um, what we saw with COVID though, was we saw this remarkable effort as it began to hit other countries um, of uh, damage control by China. So we saw some remarkable activity from Chinese state media. Uh, there is a There are certain types of governments where the messaging that they're putting out to the world is different than the messaging that they put out to their people, where they have dedicated information channels that speak uh, one message to uh, an outside audience while speaking a different message internally. So that dynamic was taking shape. So we were looking at ways in which coronavirus was being messaged to people in China versus to uh, versus what China was saying to the world. It's public diplomacy in the information space. You know, it has numerous Facebook pages with over 100 million followers, and it began to run ads, actually. It began to run boosted content, boosting state media um, assessments from China, the Chinese state government uh, messaging around uh, what coronavirus was, casting doubt on where it had originated, and framing China as what came to be called mask diplomacy, this provider of masks and PPE and general benevolence and aid uh, to countries, particularly Italy, was uh, seriously impacted as one of the early countries in the epidemic. And so you started to see ways in which countries that had state media used it uh, in that context. And Russia in particular, Again, um, the messaging internally versus externally is, is, uh, is really remarkable. They have RT and, of course, some of their sort of flagship state media English language properties. They also have an Arabic and a uh, Latin American inflections for those channels. And the Arabic content was these very dark conspiracies about the United States being the, the true source of coronavirus. Whereas what they were putting out on RT to English language audiences was they were inviting anti-vaxxers on to be guests on their program to talk about how this was all no big deal. And then now, meaning of, while at the same time telling their own people that this was in fact a very big deal and something to take quite seriously. Um, what we see now today, I'll just end with this thought, is vaccine diplomacy. So the same way there were these narratives about who had what mask and who was giving what mask to whom, um, what you're seeing is the uh, same conversation playing out in the context of the vaccine. There's a lot of denigration of Pfizer and Moderna and talking up of, uh, of Sputnik vaccine or of Sinovac. Again, depending on which country's media is producing the content, they're putting it out to a global audience, mostly in English, but again, inflected for some regional markets. Um, and right now you're seeing this battle play out about whose vaccine has more side effects, whose vaccine is more efficacious and, and whose vaccine um, is, uh, is, is the one that people should be taking. So it's this same, again, the same um, state focus, but uh, now the topic is, uh, is the vaccine rollout. That's really important for sort of global context. I'm, I'm curious, Joan, if you can um, jump in here with some domestic context. Um, obviously, the way the vaccine and um, coronavirus um, information has been conveyed to our own population, there are unique challenges um, in, in the way that these platforms have allowed um, influencers to gain traction, um, people who have, you know, made this sort of their brand. I'm curious what you're seeing on the domestic side and um, whether you've actually seen a rise in, in, in all of this disinformation 
um, because of the coronavirus pandemic um, about uh, vaccines and the coronavirus itself. Yeah, so we've been tracking a few different efforts, uh, looking at specifically how people's questions about COVID, its origins, its spread, the symptoms, uh, what the vac- what's in the vaccine, how those questions uh, produce what uh, Dana Boyd calls data voids, uh, which essentially are missing information. Right. We don't know, uh, for instance, the the sort of big back and forth happening this week is should pregnant uh, women get the COVID vaccine? A logical question. But when you start poking around online, uh, it becomes uh, a space where uh, different groups are very receptive to discussing it while also piggybacking medical misinformation into the conversation. But domestically, the biggest one by far has been a cloaked science operation run by Steve Bannon around COVID being a bioweapon. He went, he, he's received uh, reportedly a hundred million dollars from a uh, exiled uh, Chinese billionaire. Uh, the New York Times has written about this, uh, where they use that to found this rule of law foundation. Uh, And without getting into the specifics of the conspiracy and the dark money elements, essentially Bannon and this billionaire flew a whistleblower from Hong Kong to the United States and then paraded her around uh, different media outlets saying that uh, this is information you're not allowed to hear. And then one thing that they did, though, is they exploited our open science system. So we have communities of scientists online that know it takes two years to get an academic article out. So they use these things called preprint servers. They put their their paper up. Usually the paper has been accepted for publication pending like final review. But these open servers uh, are places now where misinformers will put out any old kind of idea about how we should deal with COVID. But what Bannon did was he put out a paper that looked like science written by this whistleblower, uh, which became known on the internet as the Yon Report. And it has nearly a million uh, engagements on Zenodo, which is a, um, an open uh, science platform. And so Zenodo's role here is basically one where you know, a really hot scientific paper might get a thousand, uh, you know, views, like that's a big paper. Uh, But this one is different, this Yon report. And when it didn't get picked up in the mainstream media, they put out a second one, which had a very plain title, like COVID is a bioweapon, rather than trying to cloak it in science. And then they even used a noto for a third Yon report to say, hey, people are spreading disinformation about us and they're quote unquote muddying the waters, right? And so it's got Bannon written all over it and it was very similar to tactics he used when he was at Breitbart. Um, But that's all to say that the domestic aspects of the disinformation around uh, COVID in particular really work on uh, a feature of the design of our um, search systems, which is ask a question, get an answer. But you don't actually know where that answer comes from usually. You don't know if it's a verifiable or reputable source. And and if it does look reputable, um, you have to also try to assess, well, how open is this platform? Could I upload anything to this platform on my own and then get, uh, you know, get the same kind of legitimacy? It's like going into a museum and and hanging up something you drew in the kitchen and then calling it art, you know, when you put a fake science paper up on one of these preprint servers, it gets all the aura of being legitimate, but it's really not. Uh, so we have a question um, in the chat and I wanna open it up to everyone um, and then go back to talking about platforms because that is absolutely um, a, a crucial aspect of the infodemic and sort of the responsibility. Um, but, you know, really important question here. Um, we've talked a lot about sort of infodemic and, and, and sort of the networks and things like that. But what is the real world magnitude of this problem? Disinformation is one thing, but how, uh, how what percentage of Americans 
will actually refuse to accept the COVID vaccine because they're misinformed. Have you all seen, um, you know, real life stories and evidence of this um, in your work, in your research, um, in your encounters with people? You know, what what are the vulnerable points here? And anyone who wants to jump in, please, please do. One of the things that's challenging with a vaccine, and um, and I believe somebody who has more medical knowledge can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the estimation for achieving a kind of herd immunity threshold here is 85%. Um, so one of the challenges with a vaccine is that while a majority of people taking it is uh, is something that, that we would still expect to see, what matters are kind of pockets where the vaccine can, uh, sorry, where the disease can continue to spread in undervaccinated portions of the population, geographically, for example, um, that then make it harder for it to be uh, truly contained. And this has been the challenge with when we talk about uh, MMR hesitancy, it's the same dynamic, right? It's, there are measles outbreaks because there are, while in aggregate across a state, uh, 85 to 90% of people may still be vaccinating their kids. If there are pockets of hesitancy where it's at 30%, um, that's where a disease, where an epidemic outbreak can, can take hold and then can begin to spread to people who have had their immunizations wear off over time uh, or who did not uh, produce antibodies in response to the immunization. And so one of the challenges is understanding whether that hesitancy is distributed across the country or confined to certain uh, parts, you know, certain certain geographical regions of the public. Uh, so, oh, I was just going to add to that that you know, in the middle of a pandemic, the causality between you know vaccine misinformation and in vaccine hesitancy, it's pretty hard um, to establish. So we have broad numbers, very general, on the number of people who've indicated they might uh, get the vaccine if one is made available free of charge. We can get some hints from um, previous outbreaks of vaccine preventable diseases, so the MMR um, example. Uh, we now have some studies linking exposure to misinformation specifically to these recent outbreaks, 2019 measles within, within certain um, regional or local communities. So can we say for sure that we know there's this causality relationship and put a number to it? Very hard, but can we predict that something along those lines will happen. I, I think it's an informed guess at this point that that's one of the likely outcomes. Is there any way you can contextualize um, how, what percentage of, of folks who are exposed to the misinformation actually follow through with um, not getting vaccinated? Is there is there anything that the research tells us about, about the, the volume of that? I will just, you know, quickly defer to other experts. The only studies I've seen um, showed that increased exposure to misinformation makes you more likely to keep challenging and even more strongly uh, your beliefs surrounding uh, misinformation or science uh, on vaccines, I should say. I haven't seen anything that's COVID um, specific, again, that would give us a solid number to work with. One of the ways you might approach this, um is to look at vaccine hesitancy and refusal among healthcare workers, uh, because that's where, you know, that's where the data is, right? Because you have to, you can have a very large proportion of the population be skeptical about any kind of treatment, but until they're faced with you're in line, you can, you're eligible, you can get this vaccine, and then they say no. Uh, that's really where we're actually going to be able to understand more about those dynamics. But one of the things that I've been reading up on are these uh, healthcare workers that are are refusing, and and uh, some of the time they just say, "Well, I read some things online," uh, or they believe that because they've already had COVID, because they've been exposed repeatedly, that they're already protected. And so uh, we have to be careful also to just kind of look more closely for the data that we have. And then what is it that they are refusing based on? But it's kind of like trying to assess the impact of misinformation on voting, which is there's usually a constellation of concerns. It's never, you know, one specific bit of information leads to one determinant outcome, right? And so there is some uh, qualitative research that will have to be done 
to flesh out like what are the the main reasons that people would would turn down an available and free <laughs> vaccine right which is also an important part here because sometimes people refuse um, medical treatment simply because the cost is too high I love this question in the chat um, and it speaks to the data voids um, situation that you described, Joan, earlier earlier in our conversation. How will it be possible to fill information voids when the answer is we don't know? You know, there's ongoing research about the, the vaccines and even the nature of the coronavirus and how it's spread and, and all of this. People are searching for certainty and an authoritative answer explaining uncertainty isn't going to be well received or propagated. How do you combat, um, you know, sort of this, this problem when the best answer is like, we don't have the information yet? Open to anyone. So I, I think thought when someone clicks that they're going to answer the question does that mean anything it just said that annette is going to answer this question live. oh so no it doesn't um waiting. okay feel free to yeah jump in <laughs> I, I think the only thing that i would add is that uh this is actually science right science is slow and methodical and uh gets it accuracy uh through investigation and so it's always going to be uh it's always going to be uh way behind when it comes to truth and i mean it comes making the truth is actually going to be way behind disinformation which is why you got to have a kind of block and tackle defense uh of misinformation narratives as they start to grow and grow and grow um and that's that's something that's really confounding our field has been I don't know how many convenings Renee and I have been at where people are just like, hey, listen, I can't combat misinfo with also spreading the meme, right? Like it, there's this relationship where you can actually do more damage. And so, for instance, like headlines are so important uh, for uh, getting people to understand what it is that they're about to read. And uh, there was an interesting debate that played out, I think, yesterday around NPR headlines related to uh, the, the COVID vaccine being effective or as effective against uh, these new variants. And so I think one thing that we can do better is do be write better headlines that are much more um, pointed and directed at the facts rather than speculative or open uh, that kind of play on people's emotions so that they click through. I would add just one last thing, which is we saw this play out with masks, right? And I feel like masks in the early stages of the pandemic are a cautionary tale for communication by institutions and authorities that we don't want to repeat. And I feel very strongly about this. <laughs> um, the What we saw there was uh, guidance that the CDC had from 2012 from SARS, where it said masks are not uh, going to do a material, you know, make a material impact stopping transmission. And that may have been relevant for SARS, but that they, they used verbatim the same guidance from that old, uh, that old material on their site. And at the time, we didn't know very much about coronavirus, but what you had was people on the internet who had very strong opinions uh, about masks uh, that turned out to be correct, right? They, they did some investigation, they found some things. And so there were some pocket of people that turned out to be correct. Meanwhile, media was writing headlines, kind of saying what the CDC and institutions were saying, which were, again, until they were sure that they should change their guidance, they did not change their guidance. And they didn't cast it in the context of, you know, we're X percent sure that this is the truth, or we just don't know yet. This is what our best guess is. And so these very authoritative sounding headlines went out that all turned out to be wrong. And that turned, that became really a crisis of confidence. And it was used by uh, people who wanted to erode confidence in the media to opportunistically kind of point back and say, look, all of these outlets got it wrong, uh, but, but my random guy over here got it right, you know? And so the, um, while not all authority resides within institutions, the challenge became how do you surface authoritative information 
recognizing that maybe the institutions weren't the ones who were putting it out as quickly as possible, but also being in the context where with these data voids, the person who creates the most compelling content the fastest is often the person whose results are returned. So if the institutions aren't communicating and aren't even putting out something that says we're 25% sure right now, give us some more time, uh, the people, you know, the, the internet experts who are saying that they're sure, whether they turn out to be right or wrong, that kind of content is what's going to go viral on social media and it's what's going to be returned in search results. And so institutions have to adapt their communication style at this point. The new administration has to adapt its communication style at this point, recognizing that this is the dynamics of the kind of, uh, you know, search and sense making environment that we all live in today. And uh can you jump in here um, in terms of, you know, when you were advising the Biden campaign, um, given all that Renee said, what were you thinking of in terms of like strategy and getting the message, the correct message, the accurate message out um, the best, knowing the sort of incentives of platforms and algorithms and how compelling content rises to the top and how misinformers game, the algorithms, what was your advice um, about getting good information out there on the platforms? Um, so the team as a whole felt that a couple of things were necessary that were missing um, from you know, the experience in the past you know, four years and particularly during the, the pandemic. Um, the campaign was in touch with um, scientists, experts on technical fields, policymakers, lawmakers, um, and it really felt that it was incredibly important um, to have as many voices of experts in, in the fields uh, and get all that content uh, and you know bring it all the way up to the ladder um, for um, the people in charge of making the decisions to, to consider. So just giving um, the decision makers as many um, scientifically or technically accurate um, options and then pair those with legal and policy. Um, tools. And once the people above me made uh, those decisions, which instruments they thought were the ones that would make, you know, the 100 day um, list, um, for instance, of, of goals to achieve and, and other um, things that the campaign uh, would try to accomplish pretty quickly to respond um, to, to the pandemic, the message was one, uh, be extremely clear, uh, adopt the modeling role that we've seen We've seen with presidents past with regard to vaccination. Jefferson was instrumental in making it a public health tool um, in, in the US. And you know, President Biden went on TV when he did this. So clear communication, the modeling uh, role, because if there's an informational vacuum, seeing repeatedly uh, people in um, certain decision-making positions subject themselves to what might be portraying as something that's counterproductive to your own health, that's a powerful message. And then perhaps even more importantly in uh, all of this, one of the things that it's very idiosyncratic, I think, um, to the COVID pandemic in the US um, and to the kind of response we had is that our agencies didn't really coordinate uh, with one another particularly um, well. This happened in regulatory um, um, manners, but it also um, happened in matters of sheer communication. We were seeing, for instance, FDA and CDC not perfectly aligned. And there were some delays that were attributable to those um, miscommunications and eliminating that uh, was uh, a priority and I think remains um, a priority, which is why making sure that we have different representation within um, government and the administration, looking at these um, issues, uh, I think remains a priority for the current administration because that ecosystem proved to be especially damaging uh, for some of the types of um, claims that were circulating just because the instrumentalization of those delays of that miscommunication about health issues in general uh, was um, allowed to occur. So th that was sort of um, the approach. Joan, this is a question from the chat, but it, it really sort of jumps off of Anna's response and um, uh, rep Representative Eshu's statement that kicked us off. Um, how can algorithms favor truth over emotion as Representative Eshu is calling for. How, once we start looking for truth, we're grappling with layers of subjectivity. Um, do you have any thoughts or recommendations? Yeah, uh, you know, I'm, I'm no philosopher, but I took a university class here and there. Uh, so the truth, though, for me is very simple in the sense that I think what we need to deliver is timely, local, relevant, and accurate information. But that's really boring. 
Uh, that's the kind of stuff that gets you to turn the channel on the TV, gets you to move the dial on the radio. Um, and so you actually have to produce in algorithms a forcing function that requires uh, what we would call uh, a public interest obligation, which we have in radio. So you turn on the radio and you're like, man, this song is awesome. I love this. And then the host you know, chimes in with, it's going to be 67 and sunny today. And uh, there's a city council meeting happening later. And you're like, can we just get back to the tunes, right? Like, I just want to hear my music. But that's a law. <laughs> they don't do that because they want to. They do that because they have to. And so we haven't really thought about, uh, and there's been a lot of lobbying that has happened to make us not think about the public interest obligations of uh, technology companies. And this extends throughout the entire tech stack, not just social media, but, you know, what would the public interest obligations be of internet service providers, of, you know, other web bin, bil, uh, businesses, what kind of, um, you know, what, what could we imagine differently if we thought about our digital tools and our devices as things that had to make room for timely, local, relevant, and accurate information. Uh, a pandemic produces this need, um, or at least reveals this need, uh, because of the way in which isolation has forced us into uh, places where it's really hard to get that kind of information. We also have, you know, local news has been uh, just decimated by platform companies and Google taking over advertising markets. Um, and, you know, we have also cord cutters that are moving away from uh, just being able to have, you know, you, you can't just get the antenna up on your television and get access to your local news anymore. There's a couple other steps involved. And so the internet and, and social media in particular have become so much more pronouncedly important in our lives. And so when we think about algorithms and we think about recommendation systems, the truth is not something that is viral. It's not that interesting. And so we have to think differently about the design. And then we have to create a standard by which new companies, as well as the, the legacy companies, um, operate in the same manner so that we don't end up developing some other kind of monstrous, uh, horrid system, uh, you know, that like tries to circumvent uh, something that should be relatively simple um, and uh, produces broad public value, especially when it comes to medical misinformation, um, it, which is a little bit different from the political disinformation. Like if we had, you know, 12 weeks and three hours, I could give you my course on that. But it's like, you know, uh, there are different kinds of buckets of information that we're dealing with, medical misinformation, inciting content, political disinformation, harassment. You know, we all have, we have to deal with each of these in a different uh, manner, of course. And so, uh, but right now, everything is so intertwined and intermixed and displayed and, and ranked and sorted in the same ways that we're just not getting the value that we need, um, the public value that we need from this technology. I just wanted to note that we are also joined by Diana Gr Grisby. Um, she is an associate professor at Brown University School of Public Health, Departments of Behavioral and Social Sciences and Epidemiology. And Diana, um, thanks for joining us. I know that you had some connectivity issues um, in the beginning. I wanted to throw it to you for our closing remarks and just you know, sort of bring home the, the, the true stakes of uh, coronavirus misinformation and viral coronavirus misinformation, which I'm sure you're familiar with in your work and um, practice, what is the ultimate toll that this sort of disinformation creates on society and, um, you know, our, our, our communities, our, our families and friends? Well, sorry that I, I missed most of the conversation, so maybe some of what I say will be repetitive. 
Um, but I think that one of the challenges with COVID-19 was that it was a perfect storm from misinformation. You had a new virus that, you know, where the, the information was constantly changing in terms of what we knew about the virus. I heard Renee mention earlier, you know, the whole idea, the, the mask uh, recommendations that at first we were told, well, you don't need to wear a mask. I think we are uh, experiencing technical difficulties again. Um, hopefully we can get Diana back. Um, but, you know, sort of, I guess one, one, another good way to close this is just sort of parting thoughts from all of you. Um, and, you know, obviously there's, there's so much here to discuss. Um, uh, there is the the fact that this is um, an unprecedented situation, the fact that we're all at home, you know, sort of our only connection to the world is the internet these days, the responsibility of the platforms, um, the different incentives that people have, um, misinformers have to uh, sort of try to game the algorithms, um, the, you know, the responsibility of public health officials. Um, uh, I know that's a that's a, a tall order to sort of um, roll all together in a parting in a parting thought, but I'm gonna try to ask you guys to give it a shot. Renee, why don't we start with you? Um, what's your takeaway from this situation? And a little give us a little bit of a look ahead for what we should be thinking of. Um, uh, with regards to this um, coronavirus pandemic and infodemic? Sure, so I would say um, two things. One, you know, I think that thinking about how platforms curate and what their responsibility is in this situation is, you know, we're at a uh, real turning point, I think, an opportunity to think about those things much more strategically now in the context of the pandemic. Uh, and, and I believe that that is a uh, critical area, uh, recognizing that the same system is used for political mis and disinformation, um, economic mis and disinformation, uh, health mis and disinformation. So just thinking about the systems that we want and the way that we can potentially get there. And then the other thing I would say though, is that in this particular case, people play a very, very significant and participatory role in spreading information today. And this is why when the content is compelling, people share it. And so thinking about both for institutions and authority figures, um, the idea of making content that's compelling to the public so that the, the people do feel that they're, that they're spreading a message, that they're spreading accurate information that they've been given that's both accurate as well as, um, you know, interesting enough to them to make them play that role in spreading good information to their community. So I think that's the other area that, uh, that we need to see brought to bear a little bit more directly in the pandemic times that we're in today. Anna, can I throw it over to you? Um, sure. So um, I would build on this idea that the pandemic is actually an opportunity uh, for us to do things that were perhaps uh, overdue. And I would probably borrow from another concept um, in epidemiology, that of preparedness. We should have been better prepared even pre-COVID to deal with vaccine misinformation and health misinformation in, in general. The data had been coming in for years at uh, um, at that point. So this is definitely a wake up call. I think it's going to inform very specific um, discussions, for instance, on the law side of things, um, discussions of how to reform section 230, for instance, people will have COVID in the back of their minds. Vaccine misinformation might not have been their primary concern absent the pandemic. So uh, in, in a very twisted way, this is an opportunity to uh, build a better um, system. And I, I sincerely hope that uh, we build from there and become better um, at, you know, the wide variety of things we need to do um, to curb the effects of vaccine and health misinformation. Joan, your parting thoughts, and um, if, if you're willing, can you give us a little bit of advice on, you know, a personal level, um, what individuals can do to reach out to people in their lives, um, friends and relatives who not only believe vaccine misinformation, but continue to circulate it. Um, uh, what, what, can, yeah. what can we do? What can we do? So one of the strategies I thought was kind of brilliant comes from uh, Taiwan, where they employ a strategy of humor over rumor. 
And I just thought this was a really funny and cute way for people to engage with medical misinformation and to uh, when, uh, you know, have a few memes on deck that when people are posting things that you're just like, I don't know, brah, like this don't seem true. Right. Like just have some things that you can use in response that don't necessarily come at someone personally or maybe don't make them feel very self-conscious, uh, but make them aware that uh, you're you're checking the facts. I think that that's one way that we can deal with some of the the headiness and the burden that misinformation places on all of us, because a lot of people, individuals share. We talked a lot about disinformers and the business of it. But a lot of people share misinformation because they're sharing it just in case. They're afraid of something else happening, especially when you see these forwards, these mass forwards that say, you know, martial law is coming. You better go get your toilet paper. And so uh, treat people with fairness and kindness uh, and like try to raise, raise awareness about uh, what they should be doing and what they could be circulating instead. And then, uh, uh, you know, do your part in sharing. Uh, I was just getting a bunch of links together about uh, vaccine information in Massachusetts that I'm going to share within my own local networks because we're heading into phase two next week. And so the idea that you could share some of the boring stuff, uh, make sure it gets out there to your personal networks, you know, Maybe, you, maybe you're friends with 50, 60, or 500 people and uh, let them know, you know, just like get the information out there because it's not always obvious to people how they would access medical care and then do it uh, in a way that is repetitive and redundant. So much of our disinformation landscape uh, plays on this long tail of like, you see it everywhere, you see it every day. And so then it starts to have this feeling of truth. And so we have to also employ similar tactics around repetition and redundancy that can really, uh, you know, bring some people into a different kind of understanding. And so uh, I thank you, Davey, though, for the great questions and the fun, the fun panel. I know it's not the, <laughs> the brightest of uh, topics. Diana, um, I know you're back with us. Uh, short and sweet, um, if, if you will. Uh, you know, sort of let's go back into the stakes of this and then um, we'll wrap up this panel. And uh, yeah, thank you for everyone coming. Um, Diana? Well, I think from a, certainly from a public health perspective, it's exciting to have a panel like this um, with people working in media um, as well as people um, in public health, uh, because I think we have to have these interdisciplinary uh, collaborations in terms of being able to effectively track the misinformation and also be able to counter it in real time. And so I think it's important that we are all on the same page in terms of the messaging, uh, that it's clear as Joanne talked about, that is timely uh, and that we do need to do some education of the public in terms of understanding the, the scientific process or the research process, that some of this information will change over time as we learn more about the virus, um, whether that's being changes in the mass mandates or even now with vaccines, people are not understanding that you need two shots to be fully vaccinated. And so people were, oh, well, somebody got the virus, but they had already had a shot. But it was like, well, they weren't fully vaccinated. So I really think thinking more about working with across different groups, whether the media, making sure we have accurate uh, stories in the media, making sure that we work with people in computer science to help us track the misinformation online, and working with uh, people in public health and medicine to make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of the messaging that we're care, you know, that we're that we're putting out there. And I think now that we have a new administration, at least we won't have everyone doing something different. Hopefully, we'll have a more coordinated effort with respect to the message um, that's being put out there. I try to make it short. And on see. that, oh yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that input. Um, uh, you know, I'll leave it there. Um, thank you to everyone who uh, attended the panel and thanks so much to our experts for their time. Um, we really appreciate it and the work continues. Thank you all, all so right, much. Take care, everyone. And for tuning in today, um, I'll be sharing a Slack channel where you can network and discuss the panels in the chat and uh, we'll be breaking for lunch, but please tune back in at 12.55 right here for our next panel on the solar winds of cybersecurity. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you for your patience.
there's 